Hi, Sally. Welcome to the I Inspire series of Beyond Diversity. We are excited to have you here. So, you know, to start to start off, do you think this pandemic has been an opportunity, and how? Oh yes, I think it's been an opportunity. And and in saying that, I'm not trying to diminish the pain that it's caused, but I think especially for women, uh, having uh, organizations see that uh, flexibility. Uh, in terms of whether you're working from home or doing a hybrid model, I think that's going to really support women in their careers going forward. I think it's going to be a major turning point when we look back. Okay, and apart from women, how else do you see it as an opportunity in terms of future of work? Well, there's a big opportunity in that I think a lot of the visa problems are going to go away, <laughs> and that's going to have a huge impact on the subcontinent. Um, and I was reading an interview with the chairman of the Tata Corporation in the Financial Times, and he was talking about that. So I think that there will be less migration for jobs around the world that can be done virtually, and people will be able to stay in their home countries, and that will have good implications for families. And that it, it that, that that's going to be very very significant. Ending that that dependence on visas that's been so characteristic, especially in the development of technology. And I think it'll be very good for com, com, countries like India. Okay, great. So focus on local, and of course reducing the carbon carbon foot uh, footprint. So more global is what we will be looking at. Okay. So that's 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 great. So Sally. Um, the definition uh, of success has changed for many. Uh, what would success mean to you in this current scenario? I think success in this current scenario means being able to lead a life that feels balanced and whole, where we really are able to spend enough time with our families, our friends, the people we love, while also having satisfying work, not see those as so much something we have to sacrifice one in order to have the other. Uh, and I really think of success in terms of contribution and the people I know who have been most successful talk about it, not in terms of achievement, but in terms of, I was able to contribute this, I was able to contribute that. So I, that's how I, I think we'll have more of that framework going forward. Super. Uh, so coming back to, you know, you've been doing a lot of work uh, around the gender space and, you know, so uh, an inclusion comes very naturally to you. So tell us a situation as to where, um, you know, inclusion uh, personally has led to greater results for you or, or some kind of impact that you have, you know, sort of really seen uh, while working with organizations. Oh my goodness, I can certainly do that. You see, I, I define inclusion and diversity very differently. Diversity is the nature of the global talent pool and inclusion is the set of practices that leaders need to adopt in order to successfully and effectively lead a diverse talent pool. And you notice I use the word behaviors and that's where I think the importance lies. I think we need to move toward being more explicit in defining inclusive behaviors, in working with senior leadership teams to practice them, and then in working with senior leadership teams to assure that they cascade down to the second and third level, which is where most of the people in an organization feel them and experience them. I worked with a very large mining company. It was a global mining company, very active throughout Asia. And what they had found was that at the sites where there was a greater perception of inclusion and more inclusive behaviors were demonstrated, those sites had a much, much better safety record. So that gave them an enormous incentive to try to develop a culture in which inclusive behaviors were practiced, were the norm, were, uh, were taught, um, and were required. So it's interesting you talk about behaviors because that's the first step of changing your behaviors is the first step to being uh, inclusive. Uh, but uh, more or less, you know, 
you know with kind of experience that i have seen working with senior leaders it sometimes ends up becoming too much of a uh, lip talk rather than actually walking the talk so what is your view around that well i i do think that um inadvertently the emphasis on uh, identifying unconscious biases has supported that um you know not walking the walk just talking the talk because biases are something we have internally so we can be aware of our biases but that's not necessarily going to change our behavior and our behaviors are what other people perceive our behaviors are are, are our actions and that's where uh that's where it's real so when you focus on behaviors when you focus on the actions that comprise an inclusive behavior that requires you to uh, walk the walk as opposed to just talk about it whereas you can pay lip service to oh i had a real breakthrough on, on a inclusive bias i discovered that i have a bias about this that or the other okay fine where do you take that there's no program for action there this requires action not not analysis So how do leaders have that breakthrough thinking is it via innovation or is it via uh, you know more observation what 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 is your say I think what they they have the breakthrough thinking first of all through self awareness first of all from genuinely learning to put themselves in other people's shoes which can be hard because when you're in a leadership position you've got so much protecting you and i remember being part of a program uh once with uh i think it was a, a, a they were managing uh, partners at law firms from around the world and i was se- seated next to a gentleman who was you know very very powerful in his field and he was talking about how hard it is for him to relate to you know some of the problems that people who come from diverse backgrounds in his company express and i said to him you know is there any time when you felt misunderstood when you felt like people really didn't understand what you were thinking or feeling or dealing with and he got this pained look on his face and he said oh yes he said i have a severely autistic son and i see how he's judged he is a wonderful boy his behavior is at odds with who he is and i see how he's judged and it is so painful for me i feel like i can't express you know who he is or what our relationship is and i said well you know that's the feeling that not it's not the circumstances but that's the kind of feeling that people who are perceived of as being outsiders in your organization that's something like what they feel. So he brought me back a, a 6 months or so later and said this gave me real self-awareness about how to be more empathic about what other people are feeling. So empathetic I think is one of the biggest trait that you're talking about. Of course awareness comes first and then empathy uh, of you know getting into the other person's shoes and trying to understand uh, the other person's perspective. um but uh, in this fast changing world and especially with you know with this new thing the concept of covid and you know you're talking about digital you're talking about artificial intelligence somewhere down the line it gets lost because everybody is essentially trying to you know sort of um run for themselves uh so in this kind of a scenario where does uh, diversity and inclusion fit in well i think that well the 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 first kind of way you started as that question i think that the key for, for leaders is going to lie in the ability to listen and i think we're going to have to spend more time helping people learn to listen because there's something that is really distinguished from artificial intelligence because any of us who've interacted with artificial intelligence knows how hilariously they often misinterpret 
what we're saying. They don't have the capacity for real listening. They have the capacity for kind of processing words, but the intention isn't there. So I think that listening skills are going to become a real key part, you know, as artificial intelligence plays a bigger role, which of course it's going to, then what is human in us needs to be emphasized. Tom Peters makes this point all, all the time. So we are going to we are going to manifest our value through our most human skills and most human abilities. And one of those is to listen closely. Uh, and um, so leaders can spend more time doing that. I always bring up the example of Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker had a rule that in any meeting, in any situation, he was the one who spoke last. And he did that partly because he knew he was very influential and if he said something, then everybody's gonna agree with him. But he also did it as a discipline so that he would listen. And that's that's it's so nice to hear because if leaders like them, you know, think so importantly about uh, the art of listening, uh, and and we as individuals are also so tuned to you know sort of give our views whenever it is you know even if it's not required. Um, I, I think the art of listening is something that we all need to cultivate, especially to build a more inclusive world as well. Okay, so. Uh, you know, coming, you talked about empathy, you talking about, um, you know, uh, you talked about this entire thing about, uh, you know, innovating and of course the new world order. Uh, and with this, the major conversation which people are really talking nowadays is about resilience. So, and we've heard this word so much in this pandemic. So what, according to you, are the traits to be resilient? Well, I think I, you know, I've spent my last 32 years studying women and women leaders. And one thing I know about women and anthropologists bear this out is that women tend to build resilience through relationship and that it's that um, tend and befriend response uh, that anthropologists talk about so that when women are under stress, it becomes ever more important for them to be in touch and have relationships that matter to them. And that, and I can speak from my own experience, that is absolutely true. Uh, and I, I'm wondering if that's gonna become more important for men as well uh, to do that. That's gonna be a very interesting thing, I think that we don't know the answer to, um, that I'm watching a number of networks and a number of groups that I am part of where men are participating on a more personal and vulnerable level. And I'm talking about men who are, you know, real high achievers. Uh, and and I, 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 as I watch that, I'm wondering, are they doing that to build their resilience? Because this is a period in which um, we're just being hit with so lot with so much and things are changing so so rapidly and so resilience is really more called for than ever and i wouldn't be surprised to see men evolving into um being more comfortable with building somewhat more intimate relationships rather than the kind of you know hey how's it going you know how about that game Saturday, at least we have it in our country, um, mentality. You know, we're just talking about sports events, et cetera, as a stand-in for intimacy. So you're talking about building relationships, you're talking about intimacy. Uh, for me, even resilience also means that it's some amount of taking risk. Yes. Um, so, you know, so risk-taking and agility go together along with resilience. So what's your take on the same? Well, I think the thing with risk is getting comfortable with taking measured risk, not silly risks. But uh, it's one thing I really, really teach in the workshops I do is that when you practice a new behavior, it feels risky and it feels uncomfortable because your mind's saying, wait a minute, what are you doing that for? This is how we do it. Um, so you feel uncomfortable so what's valuable is to become comfortable 
feeling somewhat uncomfortable because you are self-aware enough to recognize I'm changing this. I'm not used to this. This is a new behavior for me. So I, I'm just going to be uncomfortable for a while. So that willingness to move out of our comfort zone and see what we can learn there. I think is you know another thing that's an aspect as you put it of resilience but i think it's going to be very very adaptive going forward no and i love it where you said you know being comfortable by being uncomfortable i think it, it is it is it is the mantra for uh, today's world so uh, you know so you know when we're talking about now risk taking and we're talking about my next question comes around potential uh, and potential is a double-edged sword. Sometimes, despite it, one doesn't get immediate results. So what's your take on the same? And um, if you have any situation where a potential, uh, you know, uh, any situation or understand a situation where potential has, you know, you know, really, really, you know, sort of come into perspective, any, any situation that you can relate to us. Oh, certainly. I have, have long experience dealing with this, as I'm sure you know. Uh, uh, research shows that in organizations, women are likely to be judged on their achievements, what they've actually accomplished, and men on their, uh, their performance assessed on their potential. And that isn't true just for women, it's true for any diverse employee. They tend to be judged, well, I did a good job on that, but that doesn't translate into seeing what the potential is for an individual. So I think that uh, the whole notion of potential then becomes challenging when you have a highly diverse uh, organization because you're gonna have people having a tough time demonstrating what they can do. I'll tell you, I have interviewed thousands of women who have left jobs that really look good and what I hear most when I ask them is they had no idea what I could do. I hear that over and over. They had no idea what I could do. And that's a feeling of thwarted potential. So I think organizations are going to have to find more accurate, more inclusive, more robust ways of assessing potential and taking small risks of giving people assignments even when they don't imagine they have the potential for it uh, so that they can really learn where the potential lies instead of going to the usual suspects. I think we lose a lot of uh, innovation and creativity and talent that way. Okay, so good. So that, that comes, then you said organization should do this. So what should be an organization strategy? Uh, to, you know, sort of uh, work around, uh, you know, uh, getting this entire aspect of potential and innovation and empathy together for their employees? Well, uh, you, you want to start step by step, but I think a good place to start has to do with, and this is happening in companies, getting away from this once or twice a year performance review, which is done exclusively by, you know, the, the senior person. Um, evaluating the individual's um, performance. I think people need to have more input into the questions that get asked in their performance review. And I think that performance reviews should be in general focused more on potential and going forward than reviews of what was wrong in the past. Um, because the past is the past. So you know, where in this job, what have you done that made you feel most satisfied? Where do you feel most frustrated? Do you have any talents or observations that you think are really not being surfaced in a way that would be helpful to the team, to the division, to the company? Those kinds of questions, you know, when I think back, I had a whole career in corporate communications before, <laughs> I started writing about uh, women's leadership and then inclusion and diversity. And in that time, when I look back and think how differently that career would have been if I had ever been asked questions like that. 
So those are the kinds of questions that really help a person unlock what their own potential and possibility is and help them articulate it in a way that's persuasive and that the organization, the leaders and their colleagues and coworkers can understand. So I think that's where we should be focused on building cultures that are really smart about doing that. And beautiful, beautifully said, uh, Sally. Thank you so much for that. Uh, any last, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sentence from you regarding the future of work, and then we close. Yes, I'm. I'm really quite optimistic about what the future of work is going to look like. Um, I think that, and what we were talking about earlier about listening. I think that one thing that I've noticed is that in virtual communication people who are poor listeners are more obvious. So I think that that's gonna be another thing that's going to serve an emphasis on really deep and active listening because it ironically um, works especially well in a virtual environment. Great, so uh, listening is something that we all need to be uh, very, very uh, uh, focused around and especially in this virtual world. Uh, but do you think it'll continue to be virtual or it'll be a hybrid world? What is your take? Oh yeah, I think it'll be hybrid. I mean, I go back to the that interview I read with the chair of uh, Tata Corporation, who said that, uh, that he expected that their workforce would be either hybrid or all work from home at 70% by the end of this decade. And um, that's, that's that's quite something and and i see it going in that direction obviously certain sectors you've always got to have people there but uh but yes I, I i see that happening and so much of retail also now in the pandemic switching to online um so that's going to also make a difference so you know we've got things to work out in terms of being able to spread some of the profits around a little more equitably but uh, certainly I think it's going to end up being a positive thing to have this more decentralized uh, workplace. We don't need it anymore. The workplace was centralized because the means of production in the industrial revolution were too heavy and too expensive to have in any more than one place. That's not true now. So we can decentralize this and I think the, the, it will be better for human beings. So decentralization, being local, being local, and uh, of course, uh, more listening. <laughs>